Manchester United's academy has produced so many players that have come through into the first team. Right now, the player who we all love is Marcus Rashford, but who could potentially follow in their footsteps? We've seen Ole Gunnar Solskjaer give debuts to the likes of Mason Greenwood, to Heath Chong, James Garner. But how good are United's current set of academy players? Are there any individuals that we should be keeping an eye on? To discuss that today, I'm speaking to Tony Park. Uh, Tony is a Manchester United historian and he's written a fantastic book. Well, not really written, it's a catalogue of Manchester United's academy throughout the years. It took, I think, 18 years, I think, Tony, was it worth of research that went into the book itself. And it's a, it's a fantastic book called Sons of United. There'll be a link in the description. You can go down there if you want to buy it. I'd recommend it. I've got it. It is just a wonderful catalogue of Manchester United Academy. So let's have a quick chat about the Academy, Tony. I mean, as I said, the Academy has always been at the core of Manchester United. And to date, I think this is right, 3,965 consecutive first team match day squads have included an academy graduate. And that's a record that dates back to October 1937, which is absolutely sensational. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has given a few debuts to some players now. Uh, but how excited are you for the academy players now that Solskjaer is, is in charge? And as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's pretty much a given that he's going to be the manager next year. I think Solskjaer's done brilliantly, um, giving the likes of uh, Greenwood uh, an opportunity out there in Paris. Uh, Garner's got a, a couple of cameos. Tate, as you mentioned, has got a few longer games. And I think he just needs to continue doing that. My, the challenge I, already, I always have at, at this sort of stuff is that if a couple of the kids have a bad game, then particularly now with social media, so many people get on their back and say, well, he's crap or he's not good. And I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's a real short-term view that some of those comments are made around because it takes time to take that step up. It take, you know, if you can imagine your first day at work, um, you're not going to be brilliant on your first day of work. You've got to get used to the players around you, the people around you. You've got to get used to how everything works. It takes ages for you to settle into the dressing room. It takes a long time. So, you know, we've got to give them space. And, in, and unfortunately, what tends to happen is that a manager will buy – and, and, and by the way, I'm not suggesting this particular player. It's just the one that came to my mind. But someone like Matteo Darmian, you know, you will you'll probably have a lot of people who will suggest that he has failed to excel in a way that we would have hoped he would have done. You know, he's 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 not pushed on. We, he looked pretty good when he first came in the team, but you know, he, he wouldn't be necessarily anyone's first choice right now. As a constable, but he's played like 60 games, so. You look in the in, in our youth team and you say, is there anybody better than a Matteo Darman? Is there anyone better than a than a, a Rocco? Is there anyone, or at least as good as? Um, and you don't know until you give them thirty or forty games, and then you're in a position to. Scott McTominay, Sam, I think is a great example. When he first came in, people were saying, you know, is that it? What does he actually do? But in the last few games, he's actually shown now he's got 30 or 40 games under his belt that, you know, he can do a job in midfield. The, the last two or three games he's played, he's been very good. Now, in, in recent years, Tony, United's academy has gone through quite a lot of restructuring. You know, Warren Joyce has left, Paul McGuinness has left, Nicky Buck came in as a sort of academy director. Do you feel that United's academy as a, as a structure is in a good place now, especially with everything that's gone on with Man City's academy sort of changing the landscape in Manchester? Yeah, I suppose it depends, you know, what your objectives are as an academy. Our, our academy objective is is always been with the the statistic you you brought up at the beginning of you know bringing kids through to the first team, and we we have always managed to do that. It's, it's no good having you know fantastic stadia, having wonderful coaching staff, having your own mini pitch or mini mini stadium, but then you know there's no kids coming through. What's the point? Um, so as a consequence, it's, I think it's trying to get the balance right. In terms of the restructure, I think we've, I still think we've got work to do. Um, I think some of our coaches are still some of the best out there in the country. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that the, the infrastructure we've got at the moment is as good as it could be. Uh, for some reason, uh, we don't tend to be getting a lot of, you know, Rashford's a, a really good example. He's, he's a, what you would call has that kind of X factor star element. Um, there's not a lot of lads. Greenwood's one who potentially has that, but we don't seem to be producing a lot of what I would call real star players uh, for whatever reason. Why that is, I don't know. Um, and that's just not at our academy. I think you, a lot of academies do that. But I think we've we've lacked a, a degree of stability, not just 
through Nicky Butt and Paul McGuinness, but I think we've lacked a, a little bit of stability in the last days of Alex Ferguson. He took his eye off the ball perhaps in the last four or five years of his of his reign, and we we, we played a bit of catch up, and you and you saw that with the the, the youth cup results. You saw that with um, you know not winning the the under last year we did really well by the way under Kieran McKenna. We won the under eighteen uh, league North. Uh, played Chelsea, who are probably the best youth side in the country in the final. We lost to them um, with no shame. And then what do we do? We we put Kieran McKenna up with the first team, and we need a new academy coach again. So I'm not so sure that that lack of that lack of stability helps our juniors. But I still think there's good coaches beneath the surface. Um, at the end of the day, I think a lot to do is scouting. I mean, I think our scouting is very poor right now. Uh, you see some of the kids being brought in and they do two or three or four years in the academy and you just shake your head and you think, you know, is that really is that really the best 16-year-old out there? Is that really the best lad in that position that you've ever seen? And you have to question that. So, But then you've also got the reality of can you get the best? You know, if, if I'm, I'm, again, I'm making the number up, but if you've got a club such as Aston Villa or Fulham or, or you know, Swansea, whoever you want to call, and they've got some exciting talent, they're not going to want to let that kid go any more than we want to buy him. So it's all very well scouting, but you've still got to do the right thing by the other clubs to bring him to ours. So I think it's complex. I think I think there's a lot a lot going on, but I still think we've we've got we've got to do a lot better at that level of getting talent into the club. I mean, yeah, you touched on it there. And it, I suppose those individual stars that have come through. Marcus Rashford is is a good example there, and you touched on him. But Mason Greenwood, throughout his young career so far with the academy sides has been an absolutely sensational goal scorer what you mentioned it there that you feel he might have that star quality why is that what has mason greenwood done that you feel others haven't really showed in the academy well apart from his talent i mean it's a lot, a lot of it is down to the, the the player's natural talent but then you've also got his emotional maturity he's incredibly mature as a footballer um so if we take his talent first he's he's two-footed which means he can take a take a player on on either side. Very few players can do that. They're either on the left side or the right side. So he's got that ability to confuse to confuse an opponent. Um, he's incredibly aggressive. I don't mean physically aggressive, but aggressive in his approach in that he will always take a man on. He'll always have a shot at goal. Um, he's got incredible confidence to say, I'll take the free kicks. Um, and in terms of his emotional maturity, his decision-making on the pitch is very good. A lot of kids that age, their decision making is, you know, is the one area that you know is inconsistent. And he's managed to certainly under 16s, under 17s, under 18s. Now he's getting into the into the first team. We'll see if it, it translates. But his decision making under pressure is really, really good, and it, and nothing seems to phase him. He kind of reminds me, not in a physical sense, but in a maturity sense, he reminds me a little bit of, of Norman Whiteside. And what Norman had when he came into the first team was he nothing phased him. You know, and, and if you saw Mason come on against Paris Saint-Germain, he didn't seem phased in any spot. He wasn't, if, if you look at the video, he's not on the sideline, you know, jumping up and down. He's he's not sort of kicking his legs out, trying to, you know, has certain players, when they've got nerves showing, you'll see it in their body language. He was just totally cool by the whole thing. It was totally, and, and that and that's typical of his style. And I think that will hold him in good stead. So when you say, what is it about him? I think it's a mix of this natural talent, but also this this maturity. Um, and, and then you just got to touch wood and hope that he physically he's able to make the step up. Um, because as young kids' bo bones are growing and their bodies are growing, they start getting injuries. And as they push themselves harder and as they they're coming up against more physical opponents, can they can they make that adjustment? And you'll see the likes of. Um, Ryan Giggs, where Fergie would put him into the team and, and Lee Sharp was the same, put him into the team and then take him out of the team, put him in the team and then take him out of the team. Uh, Marcus Rashford didn't do that. He was kind of in the team all as, as Norman was, you know, from the word go. And he sort of stayed there ever since. So how they manage Mason and others coming through would be very interesting. Well, Norman Whiteside is not exactly a bad comparison to have there. But as well as Greenwood, Solskjaer, as we touched on there, has given a few debuts to a few players. You know, we've seen... Tahit Chong come through, James Garner. One previously was uh, when Wayne, Wayne Rooney came off and Angel Gomez came on. Uh, do you feel that any of those three players would be ready for regular first team action now? As, I suppose Angel Gomez is one that is a name that people have been talking about for a couple of years now, given that he made his debut when he was 16. Yeah, Angel's, Angel's um, 
a strange player in some ways, and unfortunately he's, he's been picked up a few knocks in the last 12, 18 months, and that's I think that's that's hindered his progress. Uh, he's the type of player that he needs a run of games. He's incredibly talented. He he might be a bit of a Jesse Lingard in terms of a late developer. So, you know, Jesse went out and loaned quite a lot, and then Jesse came back and, and, and slotted in really well. Um, Angel might need that. Um, again, technically, he's, there's nothing he can't do technically. I think he's got the confidence. He's got certainly got the mindset. It's just whether or not he's going to fit. But one of the challenges we've had, Sam, in my opinion, is, you know, we've never been kind of three or four up with, with 25 minutes to go. In a, in a game, I can't think of one where we've been three or four up with 25 minutes to go. And I think that gives the manager a chance to say, OK, we're 4-0 up. Um, you know, we're not going to lose this game. This is a great opportunity to give a Gomez not just a cameo of five minutes, but, you know, let's go out there and give him 20 minutes and see what he can do. And if you had three or four of those, then all of a sudden, and Teith Chong probably falls into that category as well. Um, the other thing that we see a lot of is... All these players have been brought in and they all kind of got into the team at the same time because we had this plethora of injuries. Well, I'm not a great... And, and we kind of did it under Fergie with the League Cup. And I don't believe that when you throw five or six kids in to you know a game where everyone else is new to the team as well and they're all challenging for the first team spot, I think it upsets the equilibrium of the whole side. And I, and I just don't think you get the best out of the older players coming back from injury or you know sitting in the reserves or the youngsters trying to fit in. I just don't think that works. What I think works best is play your best 11. And then for argument's sake, I mean, depending on what happens with Barcelona, but we're going to have seven or eight games at the end of the season. Why don't we play our best 10 and put Taith Chong on the left wing and start him and give him a whole game? Then we'll find out what he can do. And then give him another game. And then give him another game. And we're not going to lose games because Taith Chong's on the left wing. You, you know, Dallow might be on the right. So let's play him on the right and let's give him two or three runs. I think that's the opportunity that I'd like to see Oli do, whether he does or not is another thing. Um, and maybe Gomez, you know, so let's let's put Gomez in for a couple of games if that's what we want to do. Because there's no pressure. I mean, we're not going to win anything in, in terms of titles um, this season, probably. So let's, let's start to think about next season. Um, you mentioned Jimmy Garner. I like Jimmy Garner a lot. Um, central midfielder. He probably still needs to to get a bit of a bit more experience. A lot, maybe get go out and loan Jimmy. Get in, particularly into the championship, where it's a bit stronger. He could learn a lot because he's got a, he's got a good footballing brain. Um, Ethan Laird has been injured most of the season. He could do a job at, at left or right. See, I'm a big Timothy Fosu-Mensa fan. I still think that you know he and Axel Tuanzebe could come back into the team. And I don't see any difference between. You know, Axel Two and Zabi and and someone like Bae. I mean, Bae is a you know a cracker box waiting to pop, and you know without the consistency. So I sometimes wonder whether or not we're doing the best for for Tim and for Axel. So they're going to come back into the wrecking next season as well. So let's give Tim you know ten games at right back. We're struggling for a right back. Let's get the other thing is I, I think Sam. I wonder who's coaching these kids. I don't mean coaching them at the academy level, but when they get into the first team, who's mentoring them? And it's almost like you want a, and, and I don't I, I don't like using Gary Neville's word, but he played right back, Timothy plays right back. A re, get, you know, get someone like a Ferdinand back as a coach, get someone as Gary Neville back, someone who knows the position, what defending is all about, and then just coach and mentor these kids so that they can be good enough. Because personally, I'd rather Fosu Mensa get 50 games than Matteo. Uh, Damian get 50 games or Rocco get 50 games. It, there's, there's, for me, there's not that much difference between them. And yeah, the kid's going to make mistakes, but boy, some of those, you know, 50 million pound players, they make, they've equally made mistakes. So there's, there's, it's, it's a view anyway. No, it's, I mean, I agree. I've loved watching Fosu Mensa in the academy sides. And, and it's, it's, it's just mentioning there about how these loan spells in championship sides can help people. And certainly Axel's done fantastic Aston Villa. But then you look at Fosu Mensa's loan spell at Fulham and it hasn't worked out. So maybe do you keep him in the, in the team at United? There's different ways of doing it and it's worked for some, but it hasn't worked for all. Um, but other than those that we've already mentioned, are there any players that you really like in the academy that maybe aren't in the spotlight that you feel maybe in a couple of years' time could blossom through? It's hard to tell because at the moment there's lots of change. The What usually happens in January, February, the... 18s all get moved into the 23s. The 23s all go out on loan. 
some get sold in the January window. The 16s then move up to the 18s. So there's lots of lots of movement. Uh, one boy I like the look of is Anthony Alanga. Um, he's been with the club a long time. He's originally from Sweden, but he's been in the academy for some years. Um, he's got, I don't know if you saw his goal on the on the under 18s where he um, beat the entire defence last weekend and put the ball in the back of the net. It was a cracking goal um, against West Brom. So he's someone I think who you know he's still got a lot to learn. He's still got those inconsistencies. He's someone who who could probably um, you know again push on and do do well. But again, you know you, it's very hard to tell at that level. Uh, I mentioned Ethan Laird. Um, Dylan Levitt is another one that's gone under the radar a little bit. Dylan Dylan uh, is very slight. Uh, I think it's when he first got into the under 18s last season. He probably didn't have the physicality that he was needed. He probably lacked a little bit of confidence, maybe. I don't, I don't know. It's hard to tell. But this year, he's, you know, he's been incredibly consistent in the centre of midfield. Uh, he's a Welsh uh, youth international. Um, so he's another one that you, he could be a late developer. But his, his passing and his um, vision is incredible. Um, the defensive side of his game isn't quite there yet. Um, but whether you want to play him as an eight then perhaps he doesn't need it as much, whereas as, as a six, you probably want a bit more of that. So depending on where you play him. But he's one, again, that um, a lot of people don't talk about that um, perhaps is worth keeping an eye on. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, anyone anyone else who, who comes to mind. Um, there's probably a handful that have just, that, you know, just haven't got that, that next level. But you don't know what's going to happen, you know, because one of the things I've learned over the years is that, you know, kids surprise you. You know, I would never have said Scott McTominay would make the first team, but he has. I would never have said, you know, that a handful of players would have made the first team, but they did. And they and they performed very well. So you've got to be careful that you don't underestimate players but as much as you, you overestimate them. So, um, you know, you, you hope, you know, you just see what happens when they go out and loan, see see how they mature, see what they come back. And some sometimes, you know, they get to 20 instead of 18 and something just clicks and the next thing you know, you've got, a, you've got a very good player on your hands. I mean, it is always exciting to talk about United's academy because it's been such an intrinsic part of the club throughout the years. And we've seen Marcus Rashford now, Jesse Lingard. You could put Paul Popper in that if you want to as well. Scott McTominay, they're in and around the first team and it's such an important part of the club. It's, I mean, it's a really interesting point there you made about uh, Mason Greenwood and how he's got that star quality that's not just about having the football at his feet. It's about the mental side of the game, the ability mm. to be confident going straight into a situation like Paris. So I'll be very interested to see how Mason develops in the next 12 months. But, you know, it's been wonderful talking to you today, Tony. It's been really good to get some insight into our younger players, maybe those that we should be keeping our eyes on. But also important to understand there the, the complexities of bringing through academy players into first-team players, which makes United's achievement of having... 4,000 consecutive first-team matchday squads with a youth team player in it, all the more impressive. Uh, but as I said, thank you very much for your time today, Tony. Hopefully this video has helped you sort of understand United's academy, the structure of it, that what players to look at, whether that's Mason Greenwood, Tahit Chong or Angel Gomez or other ones there like Dylan Levitt that you may not have heard about. If you want to buy Tony's book, make sure you go. There's a link in the description. Genuinely, it's a very good encyclopedic history of United's Academy. I'd encourage you to get it. Uh, but hopefully, fingers crossed in 12 months time, Tony, we can do another video about after Mason Greenwood's 20 goal campaign that happens next season, eh? <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, we will. Well, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.